Solomon said, Remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers have set. You're watching the ancient landmark with Jared Jacobs. First century gospel preaching for the 21st century. And thank you and welcome to this another edition of the ancient landmark. My name is Jared Jacobs. I'm so thankful to be with you at this time. So thankful that we had this opportunity to open up God's Word, to study, and to learn more about the Word and the will of God. I encourage you to get a Bible out and follow along with the things we're going to study. I encourage you also to take any notes that you'd like to take as well. As uh, always, we remind you that if you'd like to have a Bible study with us, we'd love to spend time in the study of the Book of God. We'd love to meet at your house. You can meet at our house. Contact us and we would love to talk to you about that. If you'd like, you can contact us via our website, www.southside-churchofchrist.com. And uh, you, there are, in, in addition to contact information, there is also uh, archived television programs and sermons and bulletins and reading material and, and study material and all kinds of things there for your uh, benefit, hopefully spiritual benefit, uh, for study, for learning, and all of that. And so we, rem we remind you of that from time to time to, to let you know that we want to just speak where the Bible speaks and be silent where the Bible is silent to teach folks. And that's one way in which we teach people through the website, through this television program as well. Um, also, we would uh, certainly welcome your questions. We always have a question uh, on the program and we'd love to hear from you. If you'd like to talk to us about your Bible questions, again, you can contact us through the website. You can call 683-5386 and talk to us about your Bible question, study together. We would love to do that. love to spend time with you. You see me out, as I've said before, you see me out places. I wish you'd talk to me and, and, and uh, say hi. And uh, tell me what you think of the program. If you have... Uh, you know, if you like a particular program, that's fine. If you don't like a particular program, that's fine too. If you have a question, if you want further uh, study or further discussion about something we've talked about on the program, please do that. You see me out somewhere, just stop and say hi and stop and let's talk about it. I, I'm never too busy to talk to you about the Bible, never too busy to talk to you about, about the truth and about things necessary for bringing us uh, taking us rather from earth to heaven. The Bible is our roadmap for that. The Bible tells us how we can go from earth to heaven. We need to pay attention to it. We need to be listening to it. And certainly if I can help you in that, I want to do that. Uh, it's certainly wonderful you're here. Certainly wonderful we have this opportunity to study, to know God's Word, and to spend time in the Word and the will of God. What I'd like for us to do in this program and this time of study is to look at a question that was asked in, in the book of Acts, a question that is, on, on one hand, is a very basic question. It is. On the other hand, it is a controversial subject, and it's a controversial question. And the reason why it is controversial in nature is because people uh, give us different answers for it. And so what we need to do is we need to go and see what God has to say. What is God's answer to this question? And so we want to look, beginning in the book of Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 is going to tell us the question. And in fact, we're going to find it a few different times in the book of Acts. And we'll look at all of those occasions as well as we study together. So as we're beginning, let's look in the book of Acts chapter 2. And in Acts chapter 2, you remember, this is the occasion where the day of Pentecost, following the crucifixion, where the apostles were there preaching the gospel. They're preaching the death and the burial and the resurrection of Christ here for the first time. Amongst this great and grand number of people, some have estimated it conservatively, and like 80 some plus thousand people perhaps gathered there on this occasion. Maybe there's more than that even because you had folks from all over. Not only those uh, Jews from the immediate area, but they've come in from all around to take part in the, the uh, Passover feast. Well, the Passover feast was first when Christ was crucified. Now it's the Pentecost feast. This Pentecost feast was described by God in the book of Leviticus 
telling his people that this was one of three trips they needed to make to Jerusalem yearly. And the Pentecost, the day of Pentecost, was an occasion or an event that took place 50 days after the Passover. And so in, in chronology, Jesus' crucifixion, okay, his death on the cross, burial, resurrection, and so forth, that's taken place. The crucifixion has taken place about a month and a half before the Pentecost feast of, from, from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John's records and then about Acts chapter 2. So right there. And so as, as we read about this, bear in mind these Jews have gathered, perhaps some have stayed this long, I don't know, but there's been folks come in back into Jerusalem for the second of three feasts that God had prescribed all the way back in the book of Leviticus. And now as these folks were gathered there on the day of Pentecost, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit fell upon the apostles. They spoke as the Spirit gave them utterance, verse 4, and that what they were speaking was the wonderful works of God. In other words, they're preaching the gospel of Christ. They're preaching the truth to those who would listen. The Bible says they spoke in every man's language, and in speaking in everyone's language, they're speaking about the death and the burial and resurrection of Christ how Jesus Christ is a fulfillment of so many prophecies, specifically the prophecy of Psalm 16, specifically the Psalm of Joel chapter 2, and many others. And so as you, you continue to read, the Bible says that, that having preached this, and having preached about Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and how that they had taken Him by wicked hands and crucified and slain, and how they were responsible, He said, you're responsible for this death. Having said those things, the Bible says, the Bible tells us this, verse 36. As the Apostle Peter is speaking, he says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made the same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now verse 36, after telling them, verse 36, saying, God hath made this same Jesus whom you have crucified, He is Lord and Christ. He is our ruler, He is the anointed one, He is Messiah. Messiah that was promised is Jesus Christ and you just killed him. You killed him as we understand it now, as we, we've already seen this, you know, you killed him about a month and a half ago. You killed him 50 days ago. When they heard this, verse 37, they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? What shall they do? That's the question. In other words, what shall we do in response to this uh, charge? In other words, they felt guilty for it. What shall we do? We are guilty now. A little bit later, the question will be asked this way. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And so as, as we think about that question, that question takes a couple forms. One form is here in Acts chapter 2. What must we do? What can we do? I mean, we're guilty of the death of the Son of God. We're, we're guilty of, of this murder. And we are, here is the Messiah. Here is the Savior. Here is God's own Son. And we've killed Him. Men and brethren, what shall we do? And the answer comes back. Verse 38. But I'm not going to tell you what it is just yet. You look again in the book of Acts and also we read uh, of another occasion. In the book of Acts chapter 9. In Acts chapter 9, we read of Saul. Saul of Tarsus, the Bible says, he's, he is one who was responsible for many deaths. The deaths of Christians, I should say it that way. He is responsible for the deaths of Christians. He's responsible. He said, I took men and women. I drug them into prison. I compelled them to blaspheme. As he talks about his life later in Acts 22, he talks about this in Galatians chapter 1 and other places. I was more zealous than my fathers and I compelled folks to blaspheme. I consented to their deaths. He consented in Acts chapter 7 to the death of Stephen. Uh, we find him continuing to persecute and persecute and persecute. By the time you get to Acts chapter 9, Saul, it says, was breathing out threatenings and slaughters against the disciples of the Lord. And having breathed out these threatenings and, against the disciples of the Lord, he was going to go to Damascus, the Bible says. 
And then if he found any of that way, of this way, in other words, he found any Christians there in Damascus, Acts 9, 2, which he would find those. Find Christians in Damascus, whether there were men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, verse 3, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined a light round about him from heaven. And he fell to the earth. And he says he heard a voice from heaven saying, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? He said, Who art thou, Lord? Now to say, Who art thou, Lord, at this point, was a term of respect. It's a term of respect for someone who is greater and more powerful than he. And he says, he just been knocked to the earth. Who are you, Lord? He, and then as you continue, the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what will thou have me to do? Will have him to do for what? Again, he's been found guilty of the persecution and death of Christians. And Jesus says, you're guilty of persecuting me. Now you look back at Acts chapter 2 and those folks were guilty of killing Christ. And they said, what shall we do? He says, what will you have me to do? And Jesus says, go and arise and go into the city, and it will be told thee what thou must do. In other words, Jesus didn't tell him on the road. In other words, Saul, get ready, Saul was not saved on the road to Damascus. He was just as much a sinner here on the road to Damascus as he was the day before and as he was the year before. He was just as much a sinner then as, as, as before. But he says, what we have me to do, Jesus says, arise and go into the city, and it will be told thee what thou must do. And so he's going to go into the city, and there he's going to meet a man named Ananias. And Ananias will tell him what to do. Now what did Ananias tell him to do? Hold it right there. Third place we want to go. Acts chapter 16. In the book of Acts chapter 16, we read here about a man named Paul, the Apostle Paul. Well, that was Saul of Tarsus from Acts chapter 9. And he was told what to do, and he did it. We're going to talk about what he did. He was told to do, and, and he did it. So you jump ahead in time to Acts 19. Now, this man who was formerly a persecutor of Christians is now persecuted for being a Christian. And he is suffering. He is preaching the gospel of Christ and he is suffering for the fact that he is doing this. And so much so that in Acts chapter 16 when they go into the city of Philippi and they preach and they, they preach against the idolatry and they preach against the, the sin of that city and so forth and continuing on it was found that they cast out the devil, a devil out of this uh, gown some, and they said when that happened, they said there was a man who was using her kind of like a, a, a soothsayer, kind of like a fortune teller type situation. And, and you read Acts 16 for yourself and you'll see this. And he's using her for a soothsayer. He's using her for like a fortune teller situation because of the possession, of the demon possession that she had. Whenever the demon is cast out of her, of course she has no more of that ability at all. Well, that upset this man very much. And he didn't like that one bit. So what he did was, he went and stirred up everybody in town and stirred them up. Acts 16 says that uh, he stirred them up uh, because of this so that, he says, these people trouble us. And he was telling the people in town, he says, they teach customs which is not lawful for us to receive or observe being Romans. That's verse 21. Well, that was a lie. He didn't say anything. Paul, the Apostle Paul, Silas, Timothy, and all those others that would travel with him from time to time. In this case, we're reading about Paul and Silas. But they're not teaching things that are unlawful to do. They're not teaching things that are sin sinful at all. So this man's lying, verse 21. The multitude rose up together, and the magistrate ran off their clothes and commanded them to beat them. And he says, when they laid many stripes on them, they cast them into the, into the prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. Who, having received the charge, thrust them into the inner prison and put their feet in the stocks. That's kind of like saying, we're going to put you under the jail. Okay? Uh, the inner prison, 
That's that was deep within. Obviously, the inner part. There is remember. There's no electricity. Then there's no light. And when it's dark, there's no light. There's no nothing. There they had to sit at their feet in the stocks. Uh, there they've been beaten. And please understand, whenever their feet were in the stocks, this was a, a, a device where you had two rings that would, that would clamp down upon the ankles, leg bone, uh, you know, through there. And between there, it wasn't a chain. We think sometimes perhaps of a chain or a rope or something. It wasn't that. It was a solid piece. It was a solid bar that connected between those two. So if someone had his, had his legs in these stocks, I mean, he, he can't move him. He can't bend. You know, I mean, his legs are stuck out here because of that bar that separates you just stuck. And so you can sit down with your legs, you know, spread because you can't move them at all. They're stuck. Uh, somebody could lay down, I suppose, but still your legs are in that position. You cannot get them out of that position. Imagine the leg cramps and so forth that they're suffering. But not only that, they've been beaten. And when they laid many stripes on them, they beat and beat and beat and beat and beat until they got tired, is what happened. Uh, sometimes we, folks talk about the 39 stripes. 39, and it's true, there was a, a, a law concerning just being beaten 39 times. But that was for the Jews. The Romans were under no such law, and the Romans had no such conscience about that. So they just beat you till they got tired. And that's the kind of, by the way, just as a side note, that's the kind of beating Jesus took too. Jesus was beaten by the Romans. He was not beaten by the Jews. The Apostle Paul was beaten on this occasion. He was beaten by Roman people. Yes, he was beaten by Jews. And the Bible says, I received my 39 stripes, save one, and so forth. In other words, he's beaten by the Jews and he's beaten by the Romans too. It just depends on the situation. Acts 16 is Romans. Continue reading. Because now here he is. Uh, his back is bloody. It hurts to breathe. To lay down on your back, that's, you know, you're not going to do that. In an inner prison, with your feet in the stocks and secure in one position. And now here he is. At midnight, 25, Acts 16. Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prisons were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, verse 27, awaking out of his sleep, seeing the prison doors were open, he, he says, drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing the prisoners had fled. Now here, see, he's ready to kill himself because he sees the doors open, the earthquakes happen, the doors are open, everybody's chains are falling off, and, and bands and stocks, remember the stocks their legs were in, those are all loose now. All of that's gone on, but he, of course it's dark down there, he can't see down in there, but he sees the doors wide open and he says, oh my, I've come down here and I'm too late, uh, everyone is, is, is gone. He makes the wrong assumption, doesn't he? And he's about ready to kill himself. And that's when Paul cries with a loud voice in verse 28 and says, Do thyself no harm, we're all here. And he called for a light and sprang in. What way he called for a light? He called for light because it was dark. He called for a light because they were in the inner prison where no one could see. And he goes and he finds the apostle Paul and goes in before him. And he falls down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought him out <clears throat> and he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? There's our question again. What did they say? Well, we're not ready for what they said just yet. But that's the question before us. What must I do to be saved? You know, to, to think about what I must do to be saved is a very, uh, it's a very deep thought in, in a real sense. It's, it's soul searching. Because somebody asking the question, what must I do to be saved? Or what will you have me to do? Like Saul of Tarsus said. Or men and brethren, what shall we do? Tells us a few things. Just that question alone tells us something. What shall I do to be saved? It tells us first of all, people realize they're responsible. What shall I do 
Lord, what will you have me to do? See that? And where they said, what shall we do? And of course, there's a group of them. What shall we do? A group of individuals. And so, what can I do? What, what was possible for me to do? That's the recognition that says, I have sinned. I have done something wrong. And that's exactly what the Lord teaches in James chapter 1, 14 and 15. It says that every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. That lust that hath conceived bringeth forth sin. Sin which is finished bringeth forth death. When James speaks that, he says individuals are responsible. And that's what that question bears in mind too. Let me ask you something. Have you asked that question? Have you asked what must I do to be saved? Is that a question that, that's on your mind? What I must do. See, the responsibility falls on that individual person. The one asking the question. At no time did people say, what do they need to do? What does that person over there need to do? You know, what does John do? What does he have, need to do to be saved? He's an awful person. No, 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 no. What must I do? So the onus is on, us, on self. To make sure that we're doing what we ought to do. I. What must I do? Do is important also. Do talks about action. What must I do to be saved? I must take action. And you know it's sad to say that there are people today, and there's people in this community, and there's people all, all around that are trying to tell you you don't have anything to do. That's false doctrine. And here in a moment, I, I know we stopped at a very critical juncture. We're going to come back, and I'm going to show you exactly the answers that were given to these folks. And in every case, when they said what I must do, then the answer was, here's what you need to do. And it's what that person who asked the question needed to do. They had to take action. It is not a case where somebody says, don't worry about it, Christ did everything. No, sir. No, ma'am. It is not, don't worry about it, Christ did it all. There is an answer for every one of these folks and telling them what to do. Action must be taken. And no, it's not because you earn anything. The Bible says so. It's not in order to earn something, but it is a meeting of conditions. And maybe we'll talk some more about that in a moment. But it's a meeting of conditions. Jesus said in Luke 17, 10, when you've done all that is your duty to do, say we are unprofitable servants. We've just done what is our duty to do. In other words, you have something to do. When you have done everything, you still haven't earned anything. So make no mistake about that. When they say what I must do, what must I do to be saved? Lord, what will you have me to do? Men and brethren, what shall we do? And we say, and the, the answer is an action. It's not saying you earn something, but we're meeting those conditions that are necessary. What must I do to be saved? To be saved says you're lost. To be saved says, here are people, Jews and Gentiles. See, that's why I chose these ones, and not only because of the question, but the question is reflected by both Jews and Gentiles. That's God's plan. It's the same plan for all people, all people all over the earth. What must I do to be saved means you're lost, and you will stay lost. Get it? You will stay lost until you meet the conditions laid out by God. It's not the conditions that I made up. It's not the conditions of, of the Church of Christ. It's not the conditions of America. It's not the conditions of, you know, something like that. It is the conditions of God that's been laid out. So when he says, I, what I must do to be saved, the answer that's going to come back is an answer. That is from God it is divine in nature, and it is not made up by man. It is not something man decided to do. And so that's where we're going to, to continue in this study. We're about ready to take a break right now. And I'm so glad that you stay tuned to this point. I hope you'll stay tuned through the rest of the program because we're going to answer the question, what must I do to be saved, and talk about that in detail and show you the consistency that in every case, folks, we're doing the same thing, Jew or Gentile, whoever, and it's the same plan we need to follow today. 
So please stay with us. We're going to look into the Bible and find out the Bible answer to the question, what must I do to be saved? You're watching The Ancient Landmark with Jared Jacobs. Write to us at 2920 New Hartford Road, Owensboro, Kentucky, 42303. Visit us at Southside Church of Christ. Our website is www.southside-churchofchrist.com. We have Sunday morning Bible classes for all ages at 9.30 a.m. Sunday morning worship service at 10.20 a.m. and Sunday afternoon worship at 5 p.m. Our Wednesday night Bible classes for all ages begin at 7 p.m. Write to us for a free correspondence course. Or a subscription to our teaching bulletin, The Old Paths. We invite you to tune into our radio program, What is Written, from 1230 to 1 p.m. Sunday on WBIO 94.7. The Ancient Landmark airs daily, beginning Monday at 9 p.m., Tuesday at 1.30 p.m., Wednesday at 5 p.m., Thursday at 11 p.m., and Friday morning at 9.30. Again, our address is The Ancient Landmark, 2920 New Hartford Road, Owensboro, Kentucky, 42303. question at this time comes to us from the book of Matthew. The question was asked concerning uh, one's relationship in marriage and divorce and in remarriage. Specifically asking, does God allow for uh, marriage after a divorce? You know, there's some people today who would tell you that God only allows for one marriage between a, a man and a woman, one marriage, and then uh, no divorce at all. There are other people who will tell you that God doesn't care and that all God wants is for you to be happy, so marry and divorce and marry and divorce as you please and, until you find the right one, until you find the right mate. Well, rather than dealing in man's conjectures and man's thoughts about it, let's go to the Bible and find out just what the Lord had to say. And the book of Matthew chapter 19 is where we're going to look. Because in Matthew chapter 19, as you read uh, there in verses 1 and 2 and, and following down about through verse 9, you're going to see that there were folks there asking Jesus that very question. They asked Jesus, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any cause? Jesus, that's verse 3, Jesus answers in verse 4. And he said, have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, shall cleave to his wife. They too shall be one flesh. Wherefore there are no more twain, two, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. And so right here, Jesus answers the question. They said, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for every cause? Jesus goes and reminds them of what the Lord had said and what had happened back in Genesis chapter 2. And said, they're not two people now, they're one flesh. What God hath joined together, in other words, joined together through marriage, don't allow man to separate or to break apart. Well, that answers the question. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any cause? No, that's the Lord's answer. And so people who have this position trying to say that, well, you know, you can marry and divorce, marry and divorce at will and at random until you find the one that you like, the Lord says no. Now, as you continue reading, the people said, well, why was it that Moses allowed to write a divorcement and put her away? Jesus answers, Moses, because of the hardness of your heart, suffered or allowed you to do this, but from the beginning it was not so. 
It wasn't so that that should be. In verse 9 he says, And I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, shall marry another, committeth adultery. And whoso marrieth her that is divorced, doth commit adultery. So Jesus goes on from there to say, not only is it the fact that you can't just marry and divorce and marry and divorce at will, but rather we find in verse 9, Jesus says there's not but one exception to that rule. The rule is don't get divorced. The exception to that rule is except be for fornication. In the case of sexual sin, in the case of sexual immorality, he said it would be a case then where one could divorce and marry another. And that word marry another is there in verse 9. Marry another. Now, whoso marries the one that's divorced, though, commits adultery. And what he means by that is that, okay, with two people, one had committed adultery, one was in sexual sin. The one who was innocent of that sin married another. That left that one behind. The one left behind, he says, now someone tries to marry that person, you just committed adultery again. In other words, that, is, that was a sin also. So the only one in this case allowed to marry another is the one who is free from that sexual sin and that fornication in the first place. The rule is stay married. That's found all the way through in Matthew chapter 5 verse 32, here in Matthew chapter 19, Mark chapter 10, 11 and 12, the book of Luke chapter 16 talks about it, verse 18. And you see that again, 1 Corinthians 7 verse 11 talks about the fact that, that in the case where two people uh, had been divorced, he says you need to be reconciled. The rule is stay married. That's the rule. The exception was found in Matthew 19.9, Matthew 5.32, when he says except be for fornication. And in the exception of fornication, the one not guilty of that, okay, the one that's not guilty could marry another. The one who was guilty could no longer marry in that case. And so when it comes to this subject, we understand, yes, the Lord has been strict about it, but the Lord has His reasons for saying so because we, we need to keep that marriage pure. We need to be serious and sober and watchful when it comes to marriage. And then, as a result, live as husband and wife uh, together for the rest of our lives till death do us part. And we're back again. We want to continue in our study and looking at that question, what must I do to be saved? Now we left off in Acts chapter 16 in our study. So I just want to pick up where we left off in Acts chapter 16 and then we'll go back to Acts 9 and, and chapter 2 and so forth as we continue. But remember the question, what must I do to be saved? That's what he asked Sirs, what must I do to be saved? In verse 30, he says this. Here's the answer. Verse uh, 30 says, What must I do to be saved? Verse 31, They said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord. Verse 32, And to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night, and washed their stripes, and was baptized. He and all his straightway. And when they brought them into his house, he sat meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. That's down to verse 34. And we'll stop there for a moment. Now notice the, how this answer comes about. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? He recognizes there's something I need to be doing. He says it's, not, it's an action I must take. And I must be saved because I'm lost. What must I do? This man had heard the word anyway. If you think about it, go back to verse 25. He says there were, there were, they were singing praises to God and praying to God. The prisoners heard them. Or there's no question, the prisoners heard them. They're in the inner, inner prison with him. But isn't it fascinating that of all the people that's in that prison, and of all the people he could have gone to, and of all the jail cells that were open, this man goes to Paul and Silas' jail cell. Hmm. Maybe he knew they had something that the other people couldn't get. He goes to their jail cell. What must I do to be saved? They said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Now, people read this a lot of times and a lot of times they'll just stop right there as if the chapter just ends. But that's not the case. 
When he talks about believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. That is an answer that is not saying faith only. I know a lot of people want to talk about faith only. And just believe, just have faith only and then you're saved. And you know, you're saved at that point. Well, that's not it at all. What this was showing was how the faith itself was all encompassing. You need to believe. Now, as you go on, they spake unto him the word of the Lord. Now, he's uh, no doubt knows he needs to go to there. They've been singing. They've been praying and so forth. But now you really need to listen to this account. And you really need to listen to the biography of Jesus Christ. You need to know that he is the son of God. You need to know that he died on the cross for the remission of sins. You need to know that he, di he uh, not only died, but he was buried in that buried tomb and he arose the third day. You need to know he is the Messiah. And he came into this world to save sinners. Luke 19.10 says so. He came to save sinners just like you. He came to save sinners just like those people in your house. I thought it was interesting how many times that phrase, in your house. Your house. Now he's not talking about the, the wood and the nails and so forth. He's talking about the inhabitants of the house. He's talking about your family. They spake unto him the word of the Lord, it says. And speaking to him the word of the Lord, he took them the same night of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized. Right there, my friends, lays out for us the Lord's plan of salvation. What must I do to be saved? You need to hear. You need to hear so you can believe. See, Romans 10, 17 says, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. That's Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. Whenever they say you need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that's an absolutely true statement. But a man can't do that until he knows what to believe. He has to hear. What do I believe about the Lord Jesus Christ? Do I, just, I mean, what, what needs to take place? Well, you need to believe, like we said, He is real. He is the Son of God. You need to believe in His death and burial and resurrection and to believe that He is, is the Son of God and He died and His blood was shed for the midst of sins. You need to believe that He is the Messiah, the promised one to come. You need to believe all those things. Jesus said in John 8 and verse 24, If you believe not that I am He, you'll die in your sins. So there's no question they need to believe. You need to hear. They spoke to Him the word of the Lord. Believe. He then took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. What does that mean, to wash their stripes? Remember what had just happened to them? They'd been beaten not that long ago. They're beaten and beaten and beaten. And he takes them and washes the stripes. This man's responsible for those stripes being on there. Not to mention the fact he very well could have laid his own stripes on there too. I don't know, it just says they were taken and beaten. I don't know who all got involved in it. So besides saying the Roman, you know, Roman people did, but besides that, here you I mean you look back. And it says that, that the multitude, the magistrate were responsible for this. And they took him and they beat them, laid many stripes and cast them into prison. So now, as you look at this situation, he washes their stripes. He's soothing the pain, trying to soothe the pain. He's trying to make them feel better. This is repentance. Here is his repentance. He's not hurting them more. He's trying to, to, as best as he can, go the opposite direction. So he washes the stripes. He tries to soothe that. And then it goes on. Having done those things, he's baptized. What are you baptized for? Well, the Bible says you're baptized for the purpose, for the reason of forgiving men of sins. And we know this as well because having been baptized, he in all his straight way. In other words, it was him and it was those of his household. It was him and those of his family. When he brought them to his own home, said meet before them, he rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. There's that believing in God again. See, just like in the front part, of the first part, verse 31, just like there, he says, believe. Now, the last part, he says, he, he was believing. And so, that's how we see faith is comprehensive in nature. Faith is going to include repentance. 
It's going to include uh, our baptism. It's going to include confession, so far as that's concerned. You know, we need to confess Christ as the Son of God. That's a necessary thing. In the book of Acts chapter 8, I know we skipped that a moment ago, but you look there now in Acts chapter 8. And there in verse 36 down through verse 38, when the, when the Ethiopian eunuch was taught the truth, whenever Philip, Acts 35, began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus, they came to a certain water. And having come to a certain water, he said, the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? What's stopping me from being baptized? He said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. Remember that belief? So you had your belief again. And then he says, I want to be baptized. What's stopping me? You need to believe. He says, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And based upon that confession, he, they commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. In the book of Romans chapter 10, verse 10, he says there that with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And so I learned there, confession is made unto salvation. I confess Christ. I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Making that confession is a confession that stands as the very foundation of the Lord's church itself. That's what Peter confessed in Matthew 16, 16. Matthew 16, verse 16, whenever he says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And that confession of I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God was one that would hold these folks and would help them to endure in the coming days of the first century and even into the waning days of the first century and on into the second and so forth whenever persecution came upon God's people and the very thing they had to do was deny Christ. And they had to say Caesar is Lord. And they had to say that that. You know, Christ is not the Lord. That Jesus is not the Lord. They had to say, uh, in other words, they had to or they would be killed. They had to or they would be punished in various ways. Their family harmed. I uh, wouldn't be allowed to, to um, buy and sell and so forth. Couldn't have a livelihood. And all of that, all under that Roman rule. So please don't dismiss confession. Please don't say that that's something to take lightly because it's not. The very confession of Christ has gotten people killed. You know, it brings spiritual life to people, but it brought physical death to a lot of people too. And so here, connected with that, that uh, salvation, connected with the Lord's plan of salvation is confession. And based on that confession, then you're baptized. All those things come together. Here's a fella that was taken in that very way. And the Philippian jailer, he heard God's word. He believed it. He says he repented. He was baptized. Why? So that he could be saved. What must I do to be saved? There it is. You see this again in Acts chapter 9. You remember we left off. Here's, here in Acts chapter 9 was where Saul of Tarsus said, Lord, what will you have me to do? Lord, what do you want me to do? And I'm going to do it. Well, you go into the city and it'll be told you what you must do. Jesus didn't tell him what to do to be saved. He said, you go into the city and you'll find out. He goes into the city and he meets there. He was blind, you remember, for three days. He spent his time in those three days fasting and prayers. He is a man who then was told that Ananias comes in to where he was staying. He comes in. He has, he, he, uh, uh, the Bible says, came into him. He put his hands on him, Acts 9, 17. Put his hands on him so that the, that the, what appeared to be scales came off of his eyes and he was able to see again. And he arose, the Bible says, and he was baptized, Acts 9, 18. He arose and he was baptized. And somebody says, well, now I didn't read about all that other about you know, faith and repentance and all that kind of stuff right there. And then he just says he rose and was baptized. Well, yes, but remember when he was at, on the road to Damascus and he talked to him and he, Jesus spoke to him, Lord, what will you have me to do? Arise and go into the city and be told thee what thou must do. Whenever he asked, uh, before this, whenever he asked, who are you? And he said, I am Jesus whom you persecute. 
The next time he says Lord, he's not saying Lord as just somebody that's superior to me and I don't know who you are. He's calling him the Lord of heaven. And now he says, what will you have me to do? There's a man's faith. Then when he goes in, the Bible says he spent three days and nights in fasting and prayer. There's your repentance. See, his repentance was different than the flipping jailer's repentance. The flipping jailer wasn't repenting of killing people necessarily. He wasn't repenting of, of all of that. He was repenting of the beatings that was taking place. And so, and he was responsible for that. So he washed the stripes in that case. Here is somebody, this is Paul Tarsus, who repents by fasting and prayers. The repentance you do will be different than that perhaps. Maybe you're not guilty of of uh, you know killing someone. Maybe you're not guilty of that. Maybe you're guilty of pornography. Maybe you're guilty of drinking alcohol. Maybe you're guilty of lying. Maybe you're guilty of, of stealing things. So you're going to have to repent of things in a different manner than what these fellows did. Uh, what you, you understand? So it's not going to be that everything is a cut and dry repentance the exact same way. Repentance just means, here's what the word repentance means, a change of mind that results in a change of your life. Quite literally, what it means is, about face, forward march. He's turn, you turn away from that old life, and you want to live a new life. That's what's happening with Saul Tarsus here. That's what happened with the Philippian jail in Acts 16. And so his repentance is fasting prayers before God. He believes on Christ. He repents. When the scales are taken off and fall off from that miracle to perform, he's then told, arise and be baptized. That's what you need to do. See? And that's exactly what he did. And he was baptized. So as to forgive him of his sins. He wasn't forgiven on the road to Damascus. Somebody says, oh yes, yes. Somebody said, my preacher told me that he was saved when he fell off his horse. Well, I wish you'd look in Acts chapter 9 and you look here and you see if you find something as big as a horse in Acts chapter 9. He fell. The Bible says he fell to the earth. Now, I don't know if he's riding a horse. I don't know if he's riding a camel, mule. I don't know what he was doing. He may have been walking on two feet. I don't know what he's doing, but he fell to the earth. See? That's what the Bible says. And when he fell to the earth, he wasn't any more a saved man than anyone else. He was not a saved man then. When he was told, ask what shall you have me to do, he was still lost. That's why he said, what do you, what do you have me to do? I'm lost. Jesus said, go into the city to be told what you must do. He did not say, you're saved now. Now go into the city and what you'll find out there is what you need to do to maintain and, and continue being my child. That's not what he said. You go into the city and they'll be told you what you must do. And he goes to the city and waits in repentance. And then was told, what? Arise and be baptized. A parallel account of this, if you're studying, taking notes, Acts chapter 22, verse 16, parallel account says, uh, of this very occasion, that here's the Apostle Paul now recounting what happened in Acts 9, only it's in Acts 22, verse 16. Ananias told him, Now, why tarryest thou? Rise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Now, why tell yourself, now, why are you waiting? You need to rise, be baptized. See, that's Acts 9, 18. Rise, be baptized. Okay, Acts 22, 16. Rise, be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Now, I want to ask you something. If Saul is saved on the road to Damascus, what sins does he have to wash away? That passage says, you arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. Not, arise and be baptized because your sins are already washed away. They weren't washed away yet. They weren't taken away. He wasn't forgiven yet, but he was forgiven when he was baptized. Now, was it baptism alone? No, sir. It was no more baptism alone than it is, folks say, you're saved by faith alone. Faith alone is not a Bible doctrine. It's not found there. Baptism alone is not a, and it's not a Bible doctrine. Not a baptism alone. It's not anything alone. In fact, whenever you study, uh, 
this subject of salvation. And you look up in the Bible all the ways in which God's connected salvation. There's no less than 25 things that are said to save you. Whether you want to talk about God saving us, Christ saving us, the blood saving us, grace saving us, to talking about faith saving you, baptism saving you for, uh, in uh, 1 Peter 3.21, baptism saving you, and uh, on down the list. He that endureth to the end shall be saved. So we put those in context, of course. I understand that. We put those things in context, but the salvation part, it's not salvation by anything alone. And so that's what we find here. Here is a man who heard God's word, he believed it, and he repented, and he was baptized. That's what he's told. Now, look with me again in Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, we see this once more. Now remember where we left off in Acts 2. In Acts chapter 2, the apostle Peter's preaching. Uh, and the other, other apostles are preaching as well. Acts chapter 2 tells us Peter's sermon. <clears throat> now, <coughs> in that sermon, he said, Remember, let all the house of Israel know assuredly, God made the same Jesus whom you've crucified, both Lord and Christ. They said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? That's where we stopped. He says to them, verse 38, Repent and be baptized. Acts 2, 38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is unto you, and to your children, to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he both testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Verse 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day, they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Now you look here in your Bible, in Acts chapter 2, and he says, do what? Repent and be baptized. Somebody says, well, he didn't say anything about faith. Yes, he did. When he said, therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly. See, based on what they heard, okay, based on what they heard, Romans 10, 17, produces faith. He said, no, assuredly. To know assuredly is to believe. That's what that is. Let all the house of Israel know assuredly. Let all the house of Israel believe God hath made the same Jesus whom you've crucified both Lord and Christ. Then when that happened, when that was said, when that was taught, what shall we do? We believe, what shall we do? Now, if it had been salvation by faith alone, this is the time when Peter can say, listen, folks, you're done. You believe you're done? Congratulations, you're saved. You have nothing to worry about right, anymore, right? That's not what he said, though. That's not at all what he said. Once they would know assuredly, once they believe, what shall we do? He said, repent and be baptized. There it is again. Repentance and baptism. See? And when you repent, you've turned away from those sins. You're baptized for the remission of your sins, baptized in water. The element is water. Someone says, how do you know? Acts chapter 8 says, Acts chapter 8 tells you that they came to a certain water. Remember that? Verse 36, down through verse 38. They came to a certain water. He said, what, shall we, uh, you know, what hinders me? What's stopping me? They went and then he confessed Christ. And based upon the confession of Christ, as we've already talked about, he went and was baptized. They went down into the water and they came up out of the water. See, baptism is a burial in water. It's not sprinkling water on somebody. It's not just pouring a little bit of water on somebody. A burial, a, a baptism is a burial. Just like we think about people, uh, you know, taking dead bodies to the cemetery and you bury them. Now, whenever you take a dead body to the cemetery and you bury the dead body, or you, do you just sprinkle a little dirt on top of him? Is that what you do? Maybe someone comes in and you just have a shovel full and just kind of throw it on top. Say, it's buried. Right? You know better than that. We know how to bury a dead body. Well, what about this? Here's burial. Burying, he says, was uh, in water. The element was water, not dirt. The element was water, not air. The element was water, not leaves. Okay? Not snow or anything else you can think of. The element's water, buried, and he said it came up out of it. And in so doing, he says, you've been forgiven of sin. 
What must I do to be saved? You need to hear God's Word. You need to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. You need to repent of your sins. Acts chapter 8 shows us you need to confess your faith in Christ and you need to be baptized for the remission of your sins. And when everyone does that, you can be saved. You can rise to walk in newness of life. Somebody says, well, what about Ephesians 2, 8 to 10 that says, you know, by grace are you saved through faith. Folks, amen and amen. That's what that says. But if you go to Acts 19, where the Ephesians were converted in the first place, it says the, the Ephesians who were converted, Acts chapter 19, says those folks heard God's word and they believed and they were baptized. Okay? In other words, that's just a shortened form of saying they followed the same plan of salvation everybody else did. And whenever they followed that plan of salvation, it's later on in the book of Ephesians that Paul later writes them a letter and says, By grace are you saved through faith. Remember how we said faith was an encompassing thing? It, was, it included a, all the acts. That's how you can say, By grace are you saved through faith. That's how you can say, You're saved by faith. It's not faith alone. It's not faith only. It's the fact that that faith motivated us to obey and do what the Lord said in the first place. And that's how that happens. And we see this again. Somebody says, well, I've always been told that, that baptism doesn't save you. The baptism won't do that. Over in Colossians chapter 2, he says that that's exactly what it does. In Colossians chapter 2, and there you can read uh, in verse 12, Buried with him in baptism. Okay, buried. Remember we're talking about burial? Buried with him in baptism. Wherein I was also raised with him through faith of the operation of God, which has raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in, circum uh, in your sins, and uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened, he's made you alive. Watch this. Having forgiven you all trespasses. That's Colossians 2.13. When he said you're taken and buried in the waters of baptism, he says, by faith in the operation of God, there's your faith again, by faith, buried with him in this, he says, then you're risen with him, Colossians 2.12, risen, being dead. You used to be dead in trespasses and sins, and now you're made alive, having forgiven all trespasses. Do you want forgiven? Colossians 2.13 describes this baptism, describes this whole plan of salvation, really, and says you need to be forgiven. That's the point. What must I do to be saved? What must I do to be forgiven? You need to hear God's word, believe Jesus is the Son of God. John 8, 24, repent of your sins. Confess your faith in Christ and be baptized. And when you do, you can be saved. Now, I need to help you in that. I'd love to. You want to talk about this some more? Let's talk about it. Let's study together. And let's learn what the Lord has to say. Let's find out what God has to say. We found it. Let's do what the Lord says so we can be saved from our sins. There's no other way to do it. None of it. Do what the Lord says. Be saved before it's too late. So thankful for you listening, paying attention, and staying with us. Until next time, Lord willing, we'll bid you a good day. You have been watching The Ancient Landmark with Jared Jacobs, first century gospel preaching for the 21st century. Tune in daily for an in-depth study of God's Word. Brought to you by Southside Church of Christ.